I'm Bob Jolly, Athenaeum Director. Thank you for coming. We're pleased to have Natalie Kinsey Warnock here with us. She's going to read from her brother Leland's poetry. And um, Leland read here at least three times. Natalie and I were talking about that in, in his long career, being a renowned poet and having an association with the Athenaeum. So we're really grateful to have Natalie here reading Leland's poetry. I'm going to introduce Natalie in just a minute. Um, I'm going to read from two people who had columns in North Country newspapers, uh, the Barton Chronicle and the Newport Express. Um, and these were people who were recording daily events. These two books happened to be from the 1970s, the columns. L Luden Young wrote these kind of, I don't know, funny and acerbic columns. Um, that was in the Barton Chronicle. And Daisy Dopp talked about the farm that she lived on, the Sherburn Farm. That was her uh, maiden name. And that is the farm that Bread and Puppet is on now. So there's a long succession of use of this farm. And that's a little bit of the notoriety of Daisy Dopp. And now I'm going to go back to my, um, to my script here so I can introduce. The point of the NEK authors collection, or Northeast Kingdom authors, is that the Athenaeum is going to collect as many names of all the writers who lived in this place as we can find. It is not necessarily that people wrote books about the Northeast Kingdom, but they lived here, they grew up here, and or they summered here. So we have a physical collection of books. We probably have 400 books at this point. In some cases, a person wrote one book, and we have one book. In some cases, as in Natalie, we have her entire collection because she gave it to us. We have an entire collection of her brother's books because she gave it to us, and we are buying books from selected authors, say Galway Cannell, who has read here, has a long association with the Athenaeum, Reeve Lindbergh, um, Richard Brown, um, people who, who have uh, a long reading history here at the Athenaeum. Um, you can use this collection and you can help it grow by supplying names that we don't have. And you can support the program with a monetary contribution if you're driven to do so. Um, the collection is in the balcony, I guess you can't see it from here, but right outside this room, there's a collection in the balcony um, and there's a sign that says NEK authors. You just have to ask somebody to be able to go in and use the collection. It's, it's cataloged, librarians care about this, by the author's last name and the date of the publication. So you could go up there and you can see about 50 books of Galway Canal. The first one he published, the last one he published, and the collection is sort of like a, a fiction collection, alphabetical by the author's name, but then the books are arranged chronologically. So we're hoping um, to represent everybody who's in the, in, in the kingdom and who's published a book. Um, I want to thank the main contributors to this collection. We put together some money to start this, and it was um, from these people, Chris Hadsel and Bill Mayers, Bill McGuire, Eric Hansen, the Tolke Wood Foundation, Concept 2 Rowing, Frank and Melissa Bryan, and MJ Davis. There are some smaller $10, $25 collections, and we're grateful to have that. Uh, this will be a permanent collection. Though this is a public library, we will not weave these books. They'll always be here. In most cases, we have circulating collection books. The NAK Authors Collection you have to use here, but in most cases, we have the books in a circulating collection that you can check out. So I'm in, going to introduce Natalie, at least in a, in a very brief way. I always say of these intros, this is one tiny portion of a person's life. They're going to tell you what they really do and what they care most about. This is what I can say. Um, first of all, what Natalie says about herself. My sister, three brothers, and I grew up on a Vermont dairy farm in a region known as the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, USA, where my Scottish ancestors, ancestors settled almost 200 years ago. Our lives revolved around our church, our community, and the hard work of farming. Along with milking and feeding the animals each morning and evening, there was the work of each season. Maple sugaring, plowing, picking stone, planting, haying, corn cutting, harvest, cutting wood. While my parents' lives were consumed by farming and providing for their children, they managed to pass on much more to us. My mother, a teacher, instilled in us a love of books and reading and a curiosity about everything, while my father, besides being an excellent athlete, has also encouraged our interest in the natural world, whether it was identifying birds, trees, and wildflowers, 
or pointing, pointing out constellations on a starry night. Um, among the many, many things that Natalie has done, she also developed a curriculum called Story Keepers for students, and she did a program here, she's done it at schools all over the country, where she demonstrates and teaches how she's uncovered and written about her own family history, and she encourages students to do this, to do some digging of their own, and shows them some of the tools to do so. She says, there's a way to make kids excited about history and get them involved. So it's a fantastic program. So besides writing books, she's teaching kids how to research their own family and, and then write about that. And then Natalie will read, um, after, um, after I've read from these two people, I think the reading will make more sense to have me give you some scatter shot by two of these columnists and then Natalie can read her brother's poetry and I think that's gonna be a nicer way to, to have this go. So I'm gonna read from Luden Young, and it looks like Loudon, but it's Luden. I never met this man. He was dead before I ever, I think I lived in Vermont. However, he is one of the people who wrote pieces in the local column, in the local newspaper, <laughs> and was one of Natalie's cousins. We were talking earlier. You get into these towns, and it's like, there's only five family names, and there's a lot of crossover. <laughs> That's great. Um, so this is, we have one copy of this book. This thing is really hard to find. I called Luden's daughter, who still works for, I think, the Barton Chronicle, and she says, I don't even have one. So we were lucky to get a hold of a copy of this book. And in some cases, that's the point of this collection. We're going to have the only copy in the region of, of some of the writers from this place. So this is Luden Young. He's writing in July 3rd, 1974, and he's poking, poking the summer people, it's called. Way back here in the backwoods region of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, we have a strange seasonal phenomenon known as summer folk. They are sometimes referred to by other names, but not all of them are printable. But anyhow, when the sidewalks of New York or Jersey become hot enough to fry eggs, they tend to blow here, and that's when they begin to arrive here. These people are difficult to describe. They come in all shapes and sizes, and of both nationalities, and are of all ages. They have a few things in common, though, mainly gaudy shorts, sunglasses, time off, and more money than a lot of us. There are similar there, the similarities end, and to describe them further as a group would certainly do someone an injustice. To us natives, the antics of some of these people are a source of amusement and at times amazement. But in turn, I presume our actions are likewise to them. So the lives of both of us are brightened a bit by each other. Speaking of brightening lives reminds me of the story about the New Jersey man who, many years ago, before we had become so ecologically conscious, wondered aloud to a Vermont farmer about what he should do with his garbage. The enterprising fellow, the farmer, promptly sold him a pig for $15. When the summer was over, this same New Jersey man again sought advice from the farmer as what he should do with the aforementioned pig as he was returning to the city for the winter. Quite quickly, our farmer replied that he would be glad to take it off his hands for $10, seeing as how he had had the use of it all summer. I'll bet it has been a little, it has been little tricks like this, plus the utterly ridiculous prices they have been charged for property that have endeared them to us so much. Regardless of the reason, we surely must be fast friends because they just keep coming more and more each year. Now, in some sort of balance or moderation, we welcome these people, not only for their company, but also for the benefits to us they bring with them. The first of these is the property taxes that they pay on the back farms and summer homes and cottages that they have built or bought here. And for many a pat tax poor town, they surely have been a lifesaver. The next benefit is their need for goods and services while they are here. They have the effect of a double shot on many local and area merchants and servicemen, thereby making it possible for them to continue in business in their particular locations. The upshot is that we, who live here, have a greater variety of goods and services at our disposal. I guess for a Vermonter to be patting down country people on the back must border on being criminal or immoral or at least something anyhow. 
So as not to become a criminal in the eyes of my peers, I guess I ought to cut out this flattery of our summer neighbors and shut this story down right here. So summer people, and then I thought a, a good one would be drowning in sunny and milder, <clears throat> the weather story. The weather is as much discussed, is a much discussed subject in northern Vermont this summer. It has been cussed as well as discussed, and no real solid solution has come from all this noise. The only thing that people seem to agree on is that something must be done. The farmers can't farm, the loggers can't log, the road crews can't keep up with the washout, and the gardeners can't keep up with the weeds. The tourists are disgruntled about the rain, the culverts are wearing out from so much water running through them, and the old cow's teats are growing shorter from so much dragging in the mud. Pulp trucks sit in the dooryards because they can't get into the woods, and worst of all, the fishermen think that many of the fish have drowned. The hay crop has been knocked down so often by the heavy showers that each stalk of grass has a hinge joint, and when it starts to rain now, it just lays down and waits until it's over. Then it tries to raise itself into a semi-erect position once again. One other inconvenience from all this damp weather is that the salt won't come out of the salt shaker no matter how mean you are to it. And you have to be a miner to get sugar for your coffee. The kitchen door is swelled up so that if you get it shut, you can't open it, and I am threatening to operate on it with the chainsaw. What the hell, what a hell of a state of affairs this is. What do we want to do about it besides complain? I think first we must fix the blame on someone or something. They use this procedure in divorce cases or auto accidents, don't they? Then it surely must be good enough for the rainy situation. You ask, how do we fix the blame? Well, I am not sure, but I've asked around and done some research, and I believe the logical culprit is, without a doubt, the weatherman. You wonder how I arrived at this conclusion. I'm sure. Well, what exactly is your theory about all this rain, anyhow? You see, you can't defend your reasoning either. Well, I can, sort of, anyhow, at least I'm willing to try. Now, just put yourself in the weatherman's place, and you will see the logic of my reasoning. They have their little office and their panel of dials and gauges and a whole army of henchmen and observers all over the country. But now hear this, if you are still with me. They also get a check, once a week or at least every two, and here is where the problem lies. The weather, is, the weather in no way affects their living or their way of life. And you see, they just don't give a damn about the weather, what the weather is, or how inaccurate their forecasts are. You see, their hay doesn't get wet and turn black, and their pulp truck isn't stuck in that ooze that they predicted to be partly cloudy. They probably don't even have to shovel that sunny and milder out of the driveway in the wintertime. They probably hire some poor slob to do it for them, so you can see they are undoubtedly the guilty parties. Now that we've established guilt in this case, I'll bet you are wondering what we are going to do about this soggy, sloppy situation. If I knew what the devil could do about it, I needn't think that I would be writing for this once a week sheet, now would I? If you are darned right, you are darned right, I wouldn't, because I would sure as shoot and be besieged by the Weather Bureau to go to work for them, wouldn't I? Two ho-hos for that, and thanks again. So that's a bit of what Luden was writing, pieces back in the 1970s, funny. It says here, it's not a person I know. Yeah. Um, Anna Baker, yeah, Is she, are you related? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fun book because it's got these funny drawings that are you know, silhouettes and you know, a whole bunch of things about farm implements. And so it's a very fun book to read. And, and some of these things, you just have to read them out loud, because when you read them out loud, you can act it out and you can make it more exaggerated and absurd and all that stuff. So Daisy Dobbs, Vermont, this book was issued by the New Orleans uh, Historical Society, and they're thinking about issuing this again, which is why we were going to have Bob Hunt reading. We'll have it here sometime. Um, and these are, these are columns to the, I think, the Newport Daily News. I think that's the paper. Um, 
Uh, the illustrations in here are by Peter Schumann. There's an introduction by Elke Schumann because they're on the farm where, where this photograph was taken. And these are, um, I, I guess I would say, not as, not as acerbic or humorous. They really are like what was going on on the farm. So she was doing the work and writing about what it was like to do the work. So Daisy Dobb, and this is from, I think, 1974, 1972. This is a piece called Farm Life Taught You Personal Responsibility. If the reader should be a visitor from the city, I just might be your own country cousin in northern Vermont. You people who have never lived on a farm, no doubt during, sorry, um, you people who have never lived on a farm, no doubt during some period in your life, have had a relative who did and whom you used to visit. If so, you will recall that it was quite different life than the one you had. The folks who live on a farm will remember those visits from city dwellers, how much fun it was to see their reaction to the children and the scrapes they got into. If they stayed long enough, they usually left with a much stronger sense of personal responsibility than when they came. That, to my mind, is the biggest lesson of a farm teaches, responsibility. My dad always taught me to look on a job, it must be completed, whether it was work or caring for animals. We had an example of this on our farm. Years ago, my husband went to shoot a crow to hang in the cornfield as a warning to other crows that might happen to come, that might happen to them if they did not leave the corn alone. He came back looking rather sheepish, but I did not think much about it until later when he came in. Have, haven't you got a medicine dropper? He inquired. I got one and asked, what's wrong? Oh, nothing much. I found a baby crow on the ground almost dead. Its mother was gone and the nest was scattered about. I thought I would see if I could feed it. I was disgusted and would not visit the little orphan. The idea, I said, of going to shoot a crow and bringing back a live one instead. Well, said Jim sheepishly, I couldn't stand the idea of it starving to death. It's almost guaranteed it won't live a week. I didn't say anything more, for I can't bear to see anything hungry either as well as, he, as well as he well knew. Nothing more was said about it for some time. One day my hubby came in grinning. You've never seen my crow yet. I gapped at him in consternation. Don't tell me that crow lived. Just come out and see, he replied. I did and there was the most obnoxious looking little bird hopping around in a big cage in the barn window. At first sight of me, it screamed hoarsely, but it soon became friendly. It would do all kinds of little dances to get my attention. We never tried very hard to teach it to say words, as some people do. However, it did do a few things we liked to hear. It was a born imitator and picked up things it heard. No doubt, they were not really words, but they sometimes sounded like them. It mocked the hens so well that they would answer from downstairs. It yakety yacked so much that Jim was sure it was a female. <laughs> you could say things then, like that. She made loud noises all day long when she was happy, little demented songs, loud strident calls to pass her by, and once in a while she would put her beak down between her feet and let go with cooing noises. She seldom sounded like a crow, except an occasional hoarse caw. She called to the wild crows when she saw them from her window. There were one or two that used to hang around. I wondered if they were romantically interested. She was a better watchdog than our canine, shouting lustily at any strangers who came along. She did innumerable funny and entertaining things as time went by. Summer people who came after maple syrup and eggs would hear her calling and go out to see her. Children were fascinated. Not long after we got her, a young neighbor inquired as to her name. No name, I said, meaning she had none. What a funny name for a little crow, giggled the child. And so, no name was it ever after. When the crows gathered to go south in the fall, she did a lot of extra talking back and forth with them from the open window. I often wondered if she knew that they were going away and wanted to go with them. She was never able to fly much as her wings were injured when the nest was destroyed. She could glide the length of the stable from her cage, would have soon died if she were on her own. So while the other crows went to warmer climates, she had to stay in Vermont. 
Late in March, she would begin to perk up and do a lot of calling and generally showing off. We knew then it would not be long before we would see a black friend of hers in the tree in front of the window. Whether it was an old chum or a new acquaintance, we would never know. But we like to think it was an old friend. After my first visit with No Name, it was not long before most of her care rested on my shoulders. Each morning, she had a handful of grain and some water. Each night, a slice of bread soaked in warm milk with several snacks in between. Speaking of responsibility on a farm, how long do you think we cared for that homely, little homely crow? She was with us 15 years, and I doubt if any other crow ever had her name and picture in the farm journal. So that's a sense of Daisy Dobb, and this book we have circulating copies of. We only have this one that we keep in that special collection of NEK authors, but. Um, it would be great if this is reproduced just the way it is, because it's got inside recognizably Peter Schumann illustrations, a beautiful acknowledgement and introduction of Daisy Dopp. So it's really something that's you know, right, out of, right out of our place here. So there's Lou Young, and there's Daisy Dopp. And now here is Natalie Kinsey Warner to read from us of her brother Leland's poetry. I think that's mine. I'll get that out. Years ago, Leland and I were asked by the editor of Vermont Life to write about why we live in Vermont and why we write about it. Leland and I laughed when we saw what each other had written. It wasn't word for word, but essentially we'd said the same thing. Leland wrote, my ancestors on my mother's side, forced from Scotland by the effects of the lowland clearances, shipped out to New York, took the then new canals north to Lake Champlain, and walked overland with ox carts to help clear and settle the four southern towns of Vermont's Orleans County. My father's family worked its way north from even earlier settling in the colonies. I grew up working the land. My mother's mother used to say, thank heaven they left, thank heaven they settled here. So now I live within a hugely extended family with sufficient members for strife and comfort, and since my writing subjects are history, culture, family, and the changes therein, I chose for now to continue to live here. And since this is the landscape of my life, I have not found in my considerable travels a place of, or climate more gripping. Leland wrote about Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom better than anyone, but his themes were universal life, death, love, despair, our connection to the land and to each other, and the thre threads of history and genetic memory that bind us. Besides his legacy of writing that he left us, Leland put so much good out into the world. His home was a sanctuary for children and teens where they could feel cared for and safe. In the schools, he was the best I ever saw for coaxing writing out of students writing that astounded the teachers and frankly, the students themselves. Leland noticed in particular the children that no one else noticed, the children who'd never written before, children whom no one had ever cared before what they had to say. He gave them a voice and he gave them confidence and a joy in writing. He changed lives. Our mother instilled in us a love of books, words, and a curiosity about everything, as I said. And Leland knew a lot about practically everything. Astronomy, ornithology, geology, geography, archaeology, apples, horses, English literature, any literature. The list seemed endless. He could build almost anything, fix almost anything. It seemed there wasn't anything he could do except be cancer. I adored my brother. I still can't look at a bird without thinking of him, or a book, or a poem, or the stars. The world has seemed such a diminished place without him in it. But what a privilege it was to have known him and to have him for my brother. Um, 
The first, sorry. Um, the first one I want to read is um, called The Boy Whose Braces Stole the Show. That'll be a little levity after. <laughs> um, for wonders, his classmates couldn't compete with a boy whose braces could pick up radio broadcasts, who could receive weather reports and music and news from near and far. His dentist said it was rare, but not unheard of, that it was like a crystal set he had built as a kid to listen to Dodger and Red Sox games. The boy's father said, you could unhook that one, and this one was damned inconvenient. His mother said she wished it would stop, a wish shared by his teacher, but not for the same reason. Often in class, when talking of times tables or ancient history, the new rock and roll would come out, making suggestions and requests that we boys and girls were ready to follow and answer. He couldn't be sent to the hall for something he couldn't help, but she would ask him to shut his mouth, to muffle the sound a little, though his jaw amplified it fine. We called him Hi-Fi. He wanted Sci-Fi, but a nickname he wanted was more generous than we were willing to be. Sometimes at communion, unseen speakers would talk to the priest, or songs the church had banned would begin, but his mother would send him out. Usually the stations were local, old tunes and hardware ads, but sometimes if conditions were right, 50,000 watt stations in Indiana or farther still would reach him, made him seem directly a part of a large world we despaired of ever touching in any way. Then, just when girls were getting interested and interesting, when he could be his own record hop and DJ, when he could say, this song's for you, and almost mean it, it ended. His teeth were straight. When he opened his mouth, he had to be thinking of something, like the rest of us. Had to try to speak from the heart, a remote enough place, but sometimes his high, tinny voice seemed to be coming from more distant places still. Um, one of my favorites of Leland's is one called Reading. And um, this, we both credit my mother with uh, uh, why we t turned out writing. Um, she, and this one has to do with the fact that um, our area was one of the last areas in the state to get electricity. And even when we got it on the farm, it only, the first we got it into the barn, and then um, in the house there was no electricity upstairs. It was just the downstairs. So my mother, who read to us every night, um, um, she would sit at the bottom of the stairs and uh, read and her voice would ca carry up the stairwell. And so um, that's what this, this book is about, or this poem is about. So it's called Reading. I used to read Farmer Boy to my boy, just as my mother read it to my siblings and me. But I sit on his bed in bright lamplight my mother sat at the top of the stairs between bedrooms and read by candlelight and later flashlight, the wan column of light falling on each of us when she was done. The house had been wired during the war by rural electric, so only the downstairs was done and poorly. She sometimes sat in brighter light unseen by us and played piano for us. Through the open stairwell door, music flowed, the reverse of cascades rose up riser and tread and cold air. Well, as she played slow jazz, so, slow t show tunes and fast paced hymns. We s slept after our chores while father and she finished theirs. I often sang to my son, work songs from the 30s or protest songs from my own youth. The boy in the book knew cold driving oxen in deep snow, cutting ice, as did we. Water in winter froze on our dressers, and the iron stove in the morning sat like fresh-dug Arctic ore. 
Woods work for firewood or logs to sell, often chilled hands and feet beyond chill feeling, but oh, the ache of its return. My son's known cold, but not that. Or the purple swelling of frozen ears, or the agony of chill blains after outdoor winter work. But neither did his kinder childhood allow him to know the work he helped pull the family through. The work he did helped pull the family through. This one's called Swing. Running across stubble that would shred horse hide and the balls of our feet, my brother and I shagged flies our father hit to us in the summer dusks. Tiring of that, he would teach us to pitch and catch fastballs, the slap in our gloves like the sound of punching an ornery cow. And the missed ones slugs in the ribs, or head must have felt the same. Teaching us hitting, he would say, swing, swing, don't let them all go by. The month after first cut hay was in, we covered the one flat field with glove and bat and ball until the rowan grew too tall and we left off for work that was work. But those evenings after chores were done, when the grass stained balls came hard, we were grateful for flies that got above the sea of green or for high sailing fastballs, easy to see. My father, if he'd had a choice, would have been an outfielder for the Red Sox, whom he fell asleep listening to on the car's front seat Saturday morning, Sunday afternoons, or a drummer in Glenn Miller's band, a sound he could still sometimes find on the dial, and that he himself made playing in local dance halls and bars. He was a star on the diamond for local town teams that rode roughshod over the boy men we watched play as we sat on or beside my mother in her cotton dresses, and at night as his drumsticks flashed under glass lights and we as fell asleep on bright rayon. He was good with wood, wood in his hands. In the hay field, he told us stories as we played. Iron Man, The Great Ghost, Desert Fox, Glenn Miller's Death in a Plane, Little Napoleon, The Gas House Gang, his bad knees that had stopped him from going to war. His voice carried to surrounding hills, seems to carry to me now. Having let so much go by from this distance, I tried to bring things back. How far did I stand from home? How many times strike out? And I'll read this one called Maps, and then I have a very, very short one of his to finish off with. Maps. Half the railways of England race toward the crazy window of my bedroom, the northern counties, borders, and all of Scotland cut from the map to fit. Still my bedroom, though I haven't slept there for 20 years. Still my maps, though my mother papered the walls with them while I was away at school. The book bookmobile delivered addresses in books, magazines, flyers, to our remote farming village. And I sent away to mining outfits, the world's railroads, tourist boards, shipping concerns for the maps I felt I needed, as well as the ones the librarian gave me from National Geographic. I studied them hard in my short free time on the farm, not as a route to get out, but to know exactly where I lived and could live. The world's geography slumped off my bureau, wedged open the drawers, covered my chair, papered the floor. I returned one vacation to find my, the wide world pasted to my walls and me the small center of a dimin diminished thing. The slanting light from the slanting window reached only a third of the way each day. The rest lay in a prenumbral shadow, 
tropical isles in polar dark. Pure white Antarctica swept each day by the white heat of the morning sun. Sri Lanka lay east of Brazil. The survey map of northern India, whose triangulation seemed to culminate in the world's highest peak, abutted the border incognita of Labrador and Quebec. I, angry for the collection lost, upset at the information gone, strained to some limit trying to make whole what could be seen right at home. And then having lived and grown up our whole uh, life on back roads and mud seasons and all this, this is Leland's shortest uh, poem that I'll end with. And it's called Mounting Tires. When I was a kid, we slid off roads and walked home or couldn't make hills and walked home or crashed into cars and trees. Now I beggar our budget for the best tires made. <laughs> Did you want me to read anything of mine? Okay. Um, I have a chapter. Um, this is a book of mine that's uh, is being written as we speak. Um, it's a children's novel um, called The Sound of Silence, and it's about um, one of the children um, from the Northeast Kingdom who was um, um, deaf and ended up going to the Hartford School for the Deaf, and, uh, which was built in 1817. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of children from Vermont and all my research went down to that school. And I found them from pretty much every town in, in Vermont. And um, this was one girl that I'd researched, and um, I went down there for their 200, I went down to the School for the Deaf on their 200th anniversary in 2017. And um, um, they let me stay right in the archive, uh, in the building that had all the archives, and uh, they were a great help. And so this is just chapter one of, um, this was a girl from Glover. And, so it's called The Sound of Silence. The train chuffs out of the station, three sharp blasts of the whistle piercing the air, but Agnes doesn't hear them. She stares out the window as the fields become blurs. The placid cows seeming to zip by can feel the pent up power of the engine as it surges forward. It feels like she's flying. The swaying of the cars as the train picks up speed feels the vi vibration of the huge rolling wheels behind her, beneath her matching the racing of her own heart. This is her first train ride, but there's nothing but silence in the train car. Her fingers, she fingers the card pinned to her coat. She can read what it says, even if she can't say the words out loud. Agnes Marnock, Glover, Vermont, age 10, destination American Asylum, at Hartford for the education and instruction of the deaf and dumb. Agnes hasn't always been deaf, but she doesn't remember before, only after. She was just two when the fever swept in. When it left, it carried off her hearing, her hair, and her mother and two brothers. Her hair came back, but her mother, brothers, and hearing did not. She has no memory of her brothers, but sometimes there's a fleeting fragment of her mother that always seems to just be out of reach. The smell of soap, her cool hand on Agnes's fevered brow, a lullaby sung low. That's one of the few sounds she remembers. That and the clang of kettles, the rasp of crows in the trees, a dog barking. She and Papa have cobbled together a good life, haven't they? As long as she can remember, she's helped him both at home and out in the fields. She drives the two workhorses while Papa forks the hay onto the wagon, likes the feel of the earth between her toes when she's gardening, can make a tolerable beef, a, a tolerable stew and Johnny cake, is quick to decipher the letter he, letters he writes out on her palm when hand signals alone won't suffice. But now Papa is going off to war and says, 
uh, Agnes needs more education so that she can function in the hearing world, needs more than he can offer, and if he doesn't come back, no, my papa, no, don't say that. Then she'll be able to make her way on her own, where people won't just assume she's dumb. No one in Glover thinks she's dumb. dumb. Papa has seen to that. Tells all who will listen that she is as smart as a whip that he slices invisible through the air when he says it. But Papa doesn't want her to always be tied to here. Wants her to have options for work and even family. Agnes doesn't know why Papa is going now when the war has been going on for three years already. But all he does is turn away, pretends he doesn't see her darting hands, tugging at him, asking why. Because he won't answer, she wonders if Papa resents that all he's been left with is a daughter and a damaged one at that. Agnes has wondered at least a hundred times why she wasn't taken instead of her mother and brothers. She'd asked Papa once if he wished it was Duncan and Fergus who had lived instead of her. Papa had looked sad. Why does it have to be either or, he'd scribbled on the little notebook they kept for communicating. Why can't it be and? Why can't it be all of you lived? Which sounded like the book of fairy tales Papa gave to her, where they all lived happily ever after. She tried to fill in the holes left by her brothers and mother, helping Pop on the farm and filling in as best she could in the kitchen too. But she was just a small girl and the holes were so big. After the fever Ag took Agnes's hearing, Papa started with simple, s simple words with gestures, eat, sleep, numbers, one, two, three, by holding up fingers, and facial expressions, happy, sad. She'd learned reading early with Papa pointing to objects, chair, cow, fork, and then writing the words until Agnes realized the words represented those objects. Agnes saw all words in capital letters at first because that was how Papa wrote them and didn't realize until she started reading books that words came in lowercase letters too. Colors had been hard, harder. When Papa had pointed to the sky and said blue, she thought it was another word for sky. The same had happened with apple and red. Sounds were even harder to understand since she'd never heard a cow moo or a piano. It was hard for her to understand what a piano and fiddle did. But it was because she remembered the dog barking that she understood that animals and people make sounds. But as difficult as colors and sounds were, it was concepts like patriotism, truth, lies, which proved most difficult. She knew lie only as lying down, as to sleep, and being self-reliant. Papa wants her to be self-reliant, but Agnes doesn't know what that is. Agnes still only knows present te tense, eat, doesn't know eight. When Papa's lips say eight, to her it is eight. Sleep, not slept. Run, not ran. Cry, not cry. Agnes doesn't cry because it makes Papa so sad. She's learned that when she puts cries to put her fist in her mouth to muffle the slant sound. She doesn't know that the sound she makes when she cries is like that of a great wounded beast or a bird that has lost its mate. Agnes doesn't know what songs are. She can read the words to them, but she doesn't know that music goes along with the words. And she doesn't understand rhymes. Papa showed her rat, bat, pat, the cat. And she saw they all end the same, but she does not know that they sound the same. Remembering pat the cat makes Agnes want to cry on the train because it reminds her of Harriet, the little calico kitten now grown into a rather round cat that sleeps on her pillow every night. Papa gave Harriet to Agnes on her fifth birthday and just yesterday gave her to Mrs. Anderson, the neighbor, to keep while he and Agnes are away. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson came from Scotland too and they were kind to Papa when he first came to Glover as a boy. Mrs. Anderson has always been kind to Agnes too and offered to care for Harriet while Papa and Agnes are away. Papa says they'll get Harriet back when he and Agnes both come back, but Agnes is afraid Harriet will forget her by then and want to live with Mrs. Anderson. To keep from crying, Agnes opens up the basket Papa packed for her and chews on a biscuit. It takes some chewing because Papa can't cook for beans. 
The only person Agnes know who is a worse cook than Papa is Agnes herself. And his biscuits could be used for shoe leather. leather. But she's hungry, and Papa says hunger makes the best sauce. Agnes thinks gravy would make a lot better sauce, but Papa hasn't packed any of that. As soon as she finishes, she realizes how thirsty she is, and Papa didn't send along a jug of water either. She'll just have to wait until the train makes a stop. Surely there will be a place where she can get a drink of water. But when the train stops in White River Junction, she is too afraid to get off. What if she doesn't get back on in time when the train leaves? A rush of passengers get on, and a man and woman settle into the seat opposite her. The woman smiles at her, and Agnes sees her lips moving. Agnes doesn't try to answer her. People back in Glover have grown used to the way she speaks, even if they have trouble understanding her. But she knows none of the people on the train will. So she points to the card on her coat instead. The woman le leans in to read it, then jerks her back, head back as if scalded. She says something to her husband, and they get up and change seats as if Agnes has some sort of disease. Agnes wants to run after them and tell them that death isn't catching, but of course she doesn't. She's been protected by Papa up to this point from reactions like that. She thinks about taking off the card that labels her, but decides to just look out the window instead so she doesn't have to interact with anyone else. She wakes up to the conductor, shaking her arm to tell her that she has arrived in Hartford, Connecticut. Thanks so much to Natalie Kinsey Warnock for reading to us the first chapter of This Book is in Progress, right? So there you are. You probably no one else has heard it, or no. certainly no one has, has a copy of it. And if you're watching this video, rest assured that Natalie will be a featured reader here reading much more of her own material. Just check um, the NEK authors page and, we'll, and, and our events page, and we'll have schedules of who's reading in the next round. And thank you to Natalie for reading again for us the beautiful and grounded poetry of her brother Leland Kinsey. We have his books here. We have a complete set of his works. And um, he really was a poet from here. So thank you for coming, and thanks for watching. Bye.